All right, so we've got about another 25 minutes. Let's, uh, let's just go through a couple of, I want to just talk to you guys just a bit about soul winning, all right? Just a couple of thoughts here. Now, the first thing is, is soul winning, it's a command, right? It's not a gift. And what do I mean by that? It means that some people say like, oh, you know, I'm not really good at talking. Uh, you know, soul winning's not for me. Uh, you, know, uh, you know, God didn't make me for soul winning. That, that's not how soul winning works, right? Soul winning is commanded, right? It's the same with singing. Singing is commanded, right? To praise God, right? To sing the Psalms, hymns, speaking to yourselves, right? And Psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs. So you don't come to church thinking, ah, oh, you know, singing is not for me. I'm not a singer, you know? So then when the church is singing, you're just quiet. Because when the church is singing and you're not singing, you're actually in sin. You're sinning. You're not singing, right? So you need to sing at church because it's a command. It's not a gift, right? Yes, people have different amount of talent. Some people are better at singing than other people. But you need to learn how to sing. You need to be willing to learn how to sing so that you don't sin when you are singing in church, right? It's the same with soul winning right you may not be that out there you may not be that good of a speaker you may not be oh you know it's not for me i just like you know lifestyle evangelism whatnot that sort of rubbish but um no it's a commandment it's not a gift we are commanded the bible says go jesus said go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature this is what kevin preached on on the first meeting at caloundra matthew 28 Jesus came and spake unto them, saying, All power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you, and lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. So yeah, I know we have to have a baptism soon. I know I've got to organize one of those. Um, but you're sitting in verse 20 right now. Verse 20 is, is what, that's, the, fulfill, that's the, the commission of teaching them to observe all things whatsoever commanded you. And one of the things he's commanded us is to go ye therefore and teach all nations. That's why I'm teaching you guys about soul winning, to helping you to, to learn how to go soul winning. Now notice it says, go ye therefore, go ye into all the world. It's not come into the church to hear the gospel. We go to them. That's why we go door to door, because we're going to them where they are. We don't expect them to come to us. Right? We go into all the world and we preach the gospel. It's commanded by Jesus. Now, you, some people might say, oh, you know, that was just commanded just for the apostles, right? That was just for them to do. It's not for us to do today. We're in the New Testament. You know, we, have, you know, we, we, we do it a lot better now. You know, we have new methods. In, and there's nothing new under the sun. You know, it, it, there's not that many different ways you can preach the gospel. So we need to go out there. But even if somebody says, oh, you know, Matthew 28 and, and, and Mark 16, oh, that was just Jesus talking to the apostles. Well, this is why I have this next point where Jesus said, follow me, right? Matthew 4 says, Jesus, walking by the Sea of Galilee, saw two brethren, Simon called Peter and Andrew his brother, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishers. And he saith unto them, follow me, look at this, and I will make you fishers of men a lot of people say from that verse hey if you aren't a fisher of men you're not following jesus and i agree with that because if you're following jesus you will be a fisher of men and they straightway left their nets so they stopped doing their fishing they took some priorities here right and followed him right they followed jesus so we follow jesus we will be a fisher of men you can't say i'm following jesus and you're not a fisher of men right because then because you're not jesus says here follow me and i will make you fishers of men so somebody might say well he's still just talking to the apostles so let's go into the new testament let's look at what paul writes in first corinthians he says here i write not these things to shame you but as my beloved sons i warn you for though you have ten thousand instructors in christ yet have you not many fathers for in christ jesus i have begotten you through the gospel verse 16 wherefore i beseech you be ye followers of me Right, so Paul is beseeching those at Corinth, hey, I want you to follow me as I do. And this is not the only place he mentions this. For this cause have I sent unto you Timotheus, who is my beloved son and faithful in the Lord, who shall bring you into remembrance of my ways which be in Christ, as I teach everywhere in every church. So it's not that he it's not just that he's just saying it to the Corinthian church, right? He's going around telling everybody all his ways, how he operates in christianity right and he's saying hey follow me 
And everybody knows Paul as what? One of the greatest evangelists that ever lived, right? 1 Corinthians 11, be followers of me. Look at this, even as I also am of Christ. So isn't that interesting? When Jesus says, follow me and I will make you to become fishers of men. And now Paul is saying, hey, follow me even as I follow Christ. And what was Paul? He was a fisher of men. Now I praise you, brethren, that you remember me in all things and keep the ordinances as I delivered them to you. So obviously Paul taught many other things, not just about preaching the gospel, but we are to remember him in all things. And that includes preaching the gospel, right? Uh, let's look at first uh, Philippians 3. Brethren, be followers together of me and mark them which walk so as you have us for an ensample. So he's saying, hey, I want you to follow me, but I also want you to mark others that are following me and they will be an example to you, right? For many walk of whom I have told you often and now tell you even weeping that they are the enemies of the cross of Christ whose end is destruction, whose God is in their belly and whose glory is in their shame, who mind earthly things, right? So the contrast here is people that are ungodly, they just think about the things of the world, but is that what we should be as followers of Jesus, as followers of Paul, as followers of people who walk like Paul? No, it says, for our conversation is in heaven, from whence also we look for the Saviour, the Lord Jesus Christ. So if our conversation is heaven, our conversation is on heavenly things, right? What are the things we can take to heaven, right? We can take ourselves, and we can take other people. So if our mind, if our conversation, our lifestyle, the way we live is in heaven, it ought to be a lifestyle of being a fisher of men, being able to reap those rewards and go out and preach the gospel and try and get as many people into heaven as possible. So not only Paul, but 1 Peter 5 talks about the elders of the church are to be examples. The elders which are among you I exhort who am also an elder and a witness of the sufferings of Christ and also a partaker of the glory that shall be revealed. Feed the flock of God which is among you. So this is the feeding now, right? You're sitting in a feeding. Taking the oversight thereof, not by constraint, but willingly, not for filthy lucre, but of a ready mind. So this is an exhortation to the leaders, right? Neither as being lords over God's heritage but being in samples to the flock. So you see, people don't, aren't meant to get into church leadership just because they want to rule over people and have power. No, you get into church leadership. Why? Because you want to be an example to the flock. You want to show people, hey, follow me as I follow Christ, right? As I'm following Paul and I'm marking people that walk like Paul, I want you to be able to follow me as well. So sometimes you're wondering, hey, I wonder how Victor thinks I should live the Christian life. Just look at how I live. You know, how many times am I at church? How, many, how often do I go soul winning? Do I get my wife soul winning? Yes. So that means obviously I think you should get your wife soul winning as well. So it's just everything. So you just need to follow, if you follow the things that I do, hopefully I'm a good example for you as the bishop of this church. Look at this. I, I thought this verse was great in 1 Thessalonians 1 because it's an example of a church being a great example of soul winning. 1 Thessalonians 1. For our gospel came not unto you in word only, but also in power and in the Holy Ghost and in much assurance, as we know what manner of, as ye know what manner of men we were among you for your sake. Right? So Paul is talking about preaching the gospel to the Thessalonians and saying, hey, you know what sort of people we were. And it wasn't just about the soul winning, because in Thessalonians you, you, you read about how Paul was a really hard worker as well. They worked hard to show the Thessalonian church, because there were people in the Thessalonian church that were lazy and not working. And he says here, and you became followers of us and of the Lord. So isn't that interesting? There's a link back, right, to the follow, follow me, I'll make you fishers of men. Paul saying, follow me as I follow Christ. And he says, hey, you, the Thessalonians, you became followers of us and of the Lord, right? Because if you're following Paul, you're following the Lord because Paul was following the Lord. Having received the word in much affliction with joy of the Holy Ghost. And look at this. So that ye were in samples to all that believe in Macedonia and Achaia. So that was the region that they were in, right? Saying that you as a church, you were examples of how to be to the other churches in that area. And would to God that that would be said about our church, that God would be looking down at our church and say, you know what? The church in Punchbowl, hey, you were an example to all that believed in Punchbowl and in Canterbury, right? When I look down, when God looks down at this church, he's like, hey, that's how I want every other church to be like. That's what I want God to, to say about our church. I don't, want, I don't want him to look at our church and think, oh, you know, 
be like another. I want our church to be the example, right? Where people, uh, you know, where other churches follow. God is thinking, hey, this is how we should be. Look at this. Verse 8. For from you sounded out the word of the Lord, not only in Macedonia and Achaia, but also in every place your faith to God word is spread abroad, so that we not need to speak anything. So isn't that interesting? That it's, so Paul is basically saying, hey, we, when we go to Thessalonica, you guys did such a great job that when we go, we almost don't even need to go to Solomon because everyone already knows it there. Would, that, would to God that was said about our church, right? But you can see here that the word, they're getting the word of the Lord out. That's what happens when we go soul winning. We're going out, we're preaching the word of God. The sower soweth the word, right? And then there's the different examples. So we see here the Thessalonian church, they were a great example because they were out there preaching the gospel. Now, I don't make this point as well, because I want to encourage you men to get your wives out soul winning as well. So soul winning is for men and it's for women, right? It's not just for men. And I want to show you here in Philippians 4. It says here, Therefore, my brethren, dearly beloved and longed for, my joy and crown, so stand fast in the Lord, my dearly beloved. I beseech Yodias and beseech Syntyche that they be of the same mind in the Lord. And look at this, verse 3. And I entreat thee also, true yoke fellow, help those women which laboured with me in the gospel, with Clement also and with other my fellow labourers whose names are in the book of life. So you, you men of this church, I do expect you guys to encourage your wives to get out there and preach the gospel too. This is not a job just for men. And you're robbing your wives of a blessing if they're not involved in that ministry. Because there's, not, there's really not that many ministries going on in our church. I don't even realize, right? There's basically church, right? And if you're a woman, you, you're not, you don't take part in a lot of the teaching and the preaching, right? So, you know, you don't teach, you don't preach, you know, you're not praying, you're not leading the songs and whatnot. Yeah, there's the, the fellowship afterwards, which is, which is, you know, a lot of the laboring, but not really that much work because most of the hard work is done out in the highways and hedges, right? And if your wives are not out there with a chance, that, that, that's our main ministry. Like this, there's a main ministry at this church. It's soul winning. And if your wife's not involved in it, then, then she's not involved in a, in a huge part of what this church is. But not only that, you're, I, I, you're encouraging disobedience, right? Because we are commanded to go out soul winning. And this is why, this is why I make sure, you'll, you'll notice, I always make sure my wife goes soul winning. And if there's a lady that, if, you know, even if I've gone soul winning, even if I have to skip a week because nobody else is going soul winning, right? Uh, I'll get my wife to go. You know, if I plan, sometimes I plan to go on a Sunday and then I don't go on Saturday, but then on Sunday a girl goes, right? Now, if that happens, I'll get my wife to go, right? If she hasn't gone, because she might not have gone for the last couple of weeks because no other ladies are going, right? But I, I make sure my wife goes soul because I want her to be part of the soul winning ministry. I want her to be able to take part in reaping and planting the seed. But not only that, like I want her to be a good example to my children because I want my daughters to know that they need to go soul winning. And even as a mother, there's that time where mom goes out soul winning as well. So that's why I always make sure. You'll know that my, I would always try and get my wife out soul winning. I encourage her to do it. And she's been a good example in that sense, in the sense that she wants to, which is good. Um, but, you know, you've got to encourage your wife. I'm sure if you encouraged your wife more, you know, she would probably want to more if you, if you led that charge. But if you're a bit so-so about soul winning, I mean, how do you expect your wife to be, right? If you're, if you're a little so-so about soul winning, your wife's obviously not going to be as excited either. And there are things you can talk about because when she has questions and she has issues and objections that she's struggling with, you can help her with that as well. And then you can also go out soul winning together if you have that opportunity. So it's not just for the men. It's for the women also. Right Now look here in Acts 1. It says, Then returned they unto Jerusalem from a mount called Olivet, which is from Jerusalem, a Sabbath day's journey. And when they were come in, they went up into an upper room, where abode both Peter and James and John, and Andrew and Philip and Thomas and Bartholomew, and Matthew and James, the son of Alphaeus, and Simon Zelotes and Judas, the brother of James. These all continued with one accord in supplication and prayer and supplication. Look at this. With the women and Mary, the mother of Jesus, and with his brethren. So all the disciples gathered together at the day of Pentecost in that upper room, right? There was women there as well, right? And one thing you'll notice that happened on the day of Pentecost is that the Holy Ghost fell on them, right? And they were given the, the, the gift of tongues and they all went out and preached the word of God boldly. Well, look at what it says here in Acts 2. And they, talking about the Jews that were at, you know, the people that were at Pentecost that day, right? 
says, were in doubt, saying one to another, what meaneth this? And others mocking said, these men are full of new wine. But Peter, standing up with the eleven, lifted up his voice and said unto them, Ye men of Judea and all ye that dwell at Jerusalem, be this known unto you and hearken to my words. For these are not drunken, as ye suppose, seeing it is but the third hour of the day. But this is that which was spoken by the prophet Joel. And it shall come to pass in the last day, saith God, I will pour out of my spirit upon all flesh, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. See, if God only wanted men to go soul winning, why did he pour out of his spirit on the day of Pentecost on the men and the women to go out and preach the gospel to all the people that were there at Pentecost? Because no, he wants men and women to prophesy, to preach the word of God. Even, uh, I, I believe it was Philip the evangelist, when Paul goes to visit him, he had four daughters which did prophesy, right? So you can see even Philip encouraged the women in his family to go out and preach the gospel. And your young men shall see visions, and your old men shall dream dreams, and on my servants and on my handmaidens I will pour out in those days of my spirit, and they shall prophesy. So a bit of an exhortation, obviously, to the women in this church. You know, I think you should be also involved in the soul winning ministry, but also to you men as well. Hey, you know, make sure you encourage your wife to get involved in soul winning. Obviously, women are a bit more shy and whatnot. But, you know, they need to grow in that area as well. And if you encourage them, you know, the more likely they will do it as well. Now, I'll just finish on just a couple of additional soul winning tips. Um, just as we go out soul winning, not an extensive list, but as you go out soul winning, just a couple of things to think about when you're preaching the gospel out door to door. <clears throat> so tip number one, when you knock on a door and somebody answers right, and you introduce yourself, one thing, I want, one thing I think you should do, and obviously these are just tips, so if you're not comfortable doing them, and you know, it's, you know, th this is fine. You don't have to uh, agree. These are not commandments, right? These, these are just suggestions. So these are my suggestions to you. Tip number one is when you introduce yourself at the door, tell them where you're from and what you are doing, right? Because think about when somebody knocks on your door, right? What's the first question you have? First question you have is who are you and what do you want, right? So when you, when you talk to somebody, you want to you wanna get that out of the way because if you start talking and, and th they start thinking like, are you trying to hide where you're from, right? And they, they think more that you're a Jehovah's Witness or whatnot. So my, my intro obviously has changed over time. If you look up my soul winning sermons on the website, you'll, you'll see the sort of script that I use. And it hasn't really varied that much. But basically what I say right now, I say, you know, hi, my name's Victor. I'm with whoever. I'm from an independent church here over in Punchbowl, and I'm just handing out a pamphlet that explains how to know for sure you're going to heaven. Is it okay if I give you one, right? So it'll be something like that. So I've told them where I'm from, what I'm doing. You know, sometimes I'll, I'll vary that a bit, and I'll say, you know, I'm not, you know, we're not Jehovah's Witnesses. From, we're from an independent Christian church. So I let them know that. So I, and, I, and I might say things like, we're an independent Christian church called the Church in Punchbowl, but I always make sure I tell them where I'm from and, and what, I want, what I'm there for. Otherwise, they're always wondering, right? So just get that out of the way at the very beginning, especially where you're from. Because I think a lot of the cults, like the Mormons and Jehovah's Witnesses, they're trying to hide that from people, right? Because they're ashamed of where they're from. Whereas we ought not to be ashamed where we're from. So, you know, just, just tell them out front, outright, so that they, they're not worried about it. Number two is memorize the plan of salvation bible verses if you if you're out preaching the gospel and you haven't taken the time yet to try and memorize those verses you are doing a great disservice not to your just your own soul winning but to the work of christ right it's like you're not even putting in the work to to know what you're explaining to somebody you should know the gospel so well and have them those verses memorized so that when you actually get the opportunity to talk to somebody you're not worried about what you're explaining it's now more about getting that person to understand. So, you know, I know the verses off by heart so that when I'm talking to the person, I'm not thinking about, oh, what verse am I going to go to next? And I, like, I already figured all that out, right? I should already know this. I should know the plan of salvation back to front so that when I get the opportunity to talk to somebody, what I'm focusing on is how to get them to understand that plan of salvation, how to get them to understand that salvation is by grace, it's not of works. They don't need to you know, commit their life to Jesus and, and, and keep all these commandments. You know, that's what I'm trying to explain to them. So don't go out soul winning without do, I mean, I mean go out soul winning, but get prepared. You know, if you're going to go out soul winning, you need to be prepared and need to know these things. Read over our gospel tract, right? 
That's what I use. Read over it, get to know those verses, where they are. Um, and you can even like use that pamphlet, right? If you're not that quick at flipping in your Bible, you can just use the pamphlet and then, you know, if you need to search for other verses, go for it. But it's a good idea to memorize the plan of salvation. And the reason why it's good to memorize the plan of salvation and memorize the verses is it just ties into tip number three, which is when you read a Bible verse to somebody, I would recommend that you, if you can, right, show them the Bible verse as you're reading it to them. Because a lot of people, like, they'll stand there with the Bible, right? You know, and then they, they, they flip to it, so Romans 3.23, and then they just read it to them, like this. Whereas when you see me, if you've gone soul winning with me, right, like, I'll go up to them and I'll say, hey, look at this, you know? It says here, as it is written, there is none righteous, no, not one. Right? And, I, and I'll read it to them, I'll get them to look at it as I'm reading it. And it's just a lot more effective, right? Because they're hearing it and they're seeing it. It's like here when I'm preaching, isn't it a lot easier to follow? when you can see what I'm saying at the same time. It's just, it's just unconscious, right? But it's just like, if you can see it, if, if I'm talking, how much more effective is it when I've got the verses up there? It's a lot easier for you to follow than it is when a preacher doesn't use a PowerPoint, right? And they're just preaching from the Bible. It's a, it's a lot harder to follow, right? So it's the same when you're preaching at the door. You're preaching a sermon to this person. So you want them to, to look at what you're telling them. And it's just more effective if, if they're able to. Now, one thing is, is if you've memorized it, then you don't need to be looking at it as well, right? Because sometimes, like, you know, maybe they're, they're, they're inside or something, you can just, you know, read that and then you just read it to them. So sometimes, like, if you have the verses memorized, you know, you can say, like, hey, you know, Romans 3.23, you can see there, you know, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. And sometimes I do that because I want to I see their reaction. I want to I focus on how they're reacting, right? So sometimes I'll show them the Bible, right, and, and I'll read it, but I want to see, I want to make sure they're paying attention. So I'm looking at them, I'm not looking at the page. Right? So, so it's just things like that. If you're familiar with the Bible verses, you know what you're explaining, then it just gives you a bit more flexibility in how you can do things. So I would definitely recommend that. So if you're not doing that already, do that. When you read somebody a verse, show it to them at the same time. Get them to read it with you. Um, you know, they, they follow along as you read. This goes to tip number four, right? Tip number four is, if you haven't already, highlight the verses in your Bible. If you use an app, make sure those verses are highlighted. But it really helps when you highlight the verse in the Bible. I don't know if you can see that, but I sort of I use this Bible and I highlight them. So that way, when you turn to that page, there's just like an instant cue. They know exactly where to look, right? And it's just a lot easier when you read that verse to them. They're not, they're not, because they might still be looking on the page like, oh, like what verse is he actually talking about? I don't know, which, I can't see it. Whereas if you highlight it, then they, they don't have to worry about that. They know exactly where you are. Now, the reason why I've got this box here in front of me, um, I use this Bible when I, go, when I go soul winning, if I take a Bible. Sometimes I just use my phone. But if you didn't know, this, this is a waterproof Bible. Um, I don't know if you guys have seen these, but it's a waterproof Bible. Basically, you can get this all wet, you can throw it into a pool, and it still works. It, I mean, it doesn't ruin the book, because these pages, they're made out of like this really thin plastic, right? Um, so this is really good. These are really great. The reason why I bought these, these are, these are New Testament Psalms and Proverbs. I didn't buy the full Bibles because this they're a bit heavier. They're obviously heavier than a normal Bible. So this is just the New Testament Psalms and Proverbs. But this is really great when we go soul winning in the rain, right? And sometimes water's dripping and stuff like that. Those paper Bibles get all ruined. Whereas these ones, you can literally have water fall on it. Just flick it off. You just need to dry it later and wipe it off. But they're completely waterproof. So... If you don't have one, feel free to take one. You know, we, obviously in this church, we don't, we don't charge for these, right? So if you don't have, if you just want one for personal use, right? Feel free to take one, right? I've got a couple of here in the box and they come in blue, blue and, they come in blue, there's a bit, a bit of a product demo here today. So they come in blue and this sort of uh, camouflage, right? So you might not like the camouflage look, you might, the, might like the blue look, but the difference is like this blue one uses like older pages and they're a bit heavier. So you can actually feel it when you feel them side by side, but the blue one is like a little bit heavier than the green one. But if you don't like the green color, then you can use the blue one, right? And they've got, I, I printed the church in punch bowl on the front. <laughs> so you know where you got it from, but feel free to take one if you want. If, I've got more at home. So if you didn't get one today, just I can buy more. So. I don't mind but you can definitely good for soul winning but also like these are great because if you go camping or if you want you know you want to people sometimes read their bible in the pool 
You don't have to worry about you know, ruining your Bible, right? That's, that's one thing that people do. But I think it's great for if you go camping. You don't have to worry about ruining a paper Bible. There's these waterproof Bibles. So I've, I think I've brought five of each. So if you want one, feel free to take one, and then you can take that one out soul winning. Um, if you don't, I just give them to people when it's raining and when we go soul winning, they use them. Um, I've got these as well. If you, if you want like a traditional paper Bible, I buy these from the Trinitarian Bible Society. So obviously you guys can take them. They're free. Uh, there's the leather ones. So I'll show you what that one looks like. So you get your standard leather one, right? So these ones are about 35, 40 bucks or something. So if you want a personal nice Bible, you can take these, you know, then they're free. These ones cost about 11 bucks or 12 bucks. These are good for kids, right? Because these are a bit hard wearing. It's the exact same text inside. So the pages block is identical between this black one and blue one. It's just this one has a vinyl blue cover and this one has the calfskin leather cover. So this one's a bit nicer if you want to give somebody a gift or for your personal Bible. Um, if you want to give them, we, we tend to give these ones out if we follow up on somebody and if they want a Bible because a lot of people don't use paper Bibles these days. But you can give these to kids as well. I let my kids use these. So you can take the blue ones if you want your kids to have their own Bible, but you don't want to necessarily give them one that's too expensive if they're going to ruin it. So I'm showing you these Bibles because obviously you can take them, they're free, you know. But, when, but don't give them out like gospel tracts, right? Because obviously they're expensive. So we're not just giving Bibles out and just you know, mailing them to people. This is like if you think somebody's actually going to use it, take it. If you're going to use it, take it. If you want one of the waterproof Bibles, help yourself. And when we run low, I'll just buy more and then you guys can have them. Uh, all that to say, highlight your Bible verses. So if you have, if you have a soul winning Bible, the, the waterproof Bible works pretty well with just like a pencil. Right, so I've got some yellow pencils in there. You can do that now or whenever, but I just sort of color it in with a yellow pencil. The, the highlighter tends to run a bit on the waterproof Bibles. Tip number five. So I just got uh, uh, a few more. Tip number five is don't spend too much time on points they already believe. And generally this is like, you know, when we tell them they're a sinner, maybe, maybe you're talking to a Christian. They already know they're a sinner. They already know that hell is real. You know, don't just have this canned plan of salvation just memorized and you're just you're regurgitating it on them. You know, you're actually talking to somebody. So be efficient if you can. Like if somebody already believes they're a sinner, then just spend a couple of seconds on that point. If they already know hell exists, you know, just show them the verse and move on. You know, just keep drilling in all these different verses on hell when they, 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 they'll start to feel like you're wasting their time if you're just going over things they already know and they already believe. So if you can gauge that they already believe something, just, just note it and move on to the things that they don't believe. Then you, can, then you have more time to spend there rather than already losing their attention and spending too much time on things they already believe. Tip number six. This one helps me a lot. When you go soul winning, refer back to the things they tell you, right? Like, so if you ask them at the beginning, hey, what do you think it takes to go to heaven? They say, well, I think, it, I think if somebody should go to church or you know, they need to be baptized. Then when you get to what it does take to get, to get saved, you know, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, one thing that's always effective is refer back to what they told you. Hey, remember when I asked you what does it take to get to heaven, you said, you know, hey, you need to be baptized, you need to go to church, you need to live a good life, whatever they said. Tie it all together for them, right? That really helps, I think. You know, whenever I get to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved in my sort of presentation, right, I explain to people, hey, you know, a lot of people know what Jesus Christ did for them, but they're not trusting what Jesus Christ did to them. And then I'll refer back to what they said to me, right? I say, hey, remember you said, hey, in order to get to heaven, you had to be a good person. See, you know what Jesus Christ did for you, that he died on the cross for your sins, but when I asked you what you have to do to get to heaven, you weren't trusting him to get you to heaven. So that's what it means when the Bible says, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. So you see how it, it just kind of makes it a bit more personal to them, right? And more effective is you, it, it means you're listening as well because they told you something and then when you're explaining it, you're referring back to what they told you and say, hey, you, remember, you, this is what you said to me, tell me. Tip number seven. Now, don't, get, don't give too extreme an example for eternal security. Now, it's not that I don't believe extreme examples exist and it's still, eternal security is still true, but... If you give too extreme an example for eternal security, sometimes they don't receive it because the example is too extreme. 
So let me give you an example. I will say something like, you know, a person gets saved, they, they believe on Jesus, maybe they hang around the wrong people, and then, you know, they do something bad, like they commit murder, or they still go to heaven, right? But you don't want to say, like, something like, you know, somebody gets, somebody gets saved, they believe, and then, like, they rape, like, 500 women, and then they kill, like, a 1,000 people. Now, hypothetically, right, that's true, right? That person will still go to heaven, right? Because, because all their sins have been paid for. Um, now, whether that example actually will ever exist in real life is probably unlikely because somebody will probably be reprobate before they get to that point. But um, my point is, even though doctrinally it still works, you don't want to turn the person off by just giving them this crazy example. Um, sometimes, sometimes people, you know, I, I know some people that they sort of build up to it. They might just say, hey, what have you told a lie? You still go to heaven. You know, that works as well. You say, you tell a lie, you still go to heaven. They go, yes. And then you say, well, what about if you murder? So you're sort of like building up to explaining this, you know, and, and it's like when we talk to people, right? Like when I, when I introduce myself at the door, you'll notice that I always say, hey, do you think about these things? That I don't just hit them hard with, hey, do you know for sure that you're going to heaven if you die today? It's just a bit more, you know, in your face. Whereas if I build up to it, it's a bit gentler, it's a bit softer. So just keep that in mind. Don't give too extreme an example for eternal security, but make sure the point is understood, right? Tip number eight. So second last tip is have them admit that they're not saved. So that's what I try and do when I preach the gospel. I, I, like I used to just tell them they're not saved, right? Hey, you're not saved. But I find what's more effective is if I can get them to admit they're not saved, right? So I might say something like, hey, you know, I can't see your heart. You know, I'm not God, but you know, now you, you know, this is what it takes to get saved. But you told me this. You tell me, you know, if, if you were to die, are you going to heaven or not? You know, or you tell me, what are you trusting? Are you trusting your works? Are you trusting Jesus? And as they say, you know, well, I was trusting my works. I say, well, where would, where would you go then if you don't trust Jesus? So you say, I'm getting them to admit it rather than me saying, well, you're not saved. You need to get saved. Because then what, what happens when you do that? They might say, well, I am, but don't tell me I'm not saved. Do you know what I mean? So I think it's a little more effective um, and it's a little gentler, gentler as well is rather to be accusatory. You sort of help them to understand, hey, you're you know, you realize you're not saved. Um, and then from there, you can use their own admission to say you didn't believe, you know, and then explain to them. And it also helps you to get some insight to where they actually stand. Last tip, you know, and I know I've, I've talked very long, hopefully giving you a lot of information. Uh, last tip is uh, the truth hurts. So be gentle, right? So we're, we're out there, we're out there preaching the truth. You need to realize that the truth can hurt. So when you're talking to people, try and be as gentle as you can because obviously no, people, you know, when they realize they, they don't want to admit they're a sinner, right? They don't want to admit they're going to hell. And this is why, this is what we need to tell them. So because it's the truth and because it can hurt, make sure you're gentle. And, and especially so if you're excited. You know, a lot of people are excited. They get, go soul winning, they're very zealous, right? But sometimes zeal can be perceived as being pushy, right? So we just need to sort of dial that back. I know for me as well, you know, when I started soul winning, you know, really zealous, telling me, no, you're going to hell, but you've got to believe this, right? And, and from you, it's coming from a point of love because you want people to believe. It's like, come on, believe this. But from them, it might not be perceived that way. We just need to understand how, we need to consider how we're perceived, right? You can't always control how people are going to react but you need to be considerate that, hey, what you're sharing is some pretty hard-hitting stuff, so be gentle. So let's just end on these two verses. Proverbs 15 says, A soft answer turneth away wrath, wrath, but grievous words stir up anger. Right? So that's why a soft answer. We want to be gentle. The tongue of the wise useth knowledge aright, but the mouth of fools poureth out, poureth out foolishness. So a great two verses here in Proverbs 15. Soft answer, but it says here, you use knowledge aright. So it's not just about how much knowledge you have if you don't use it correctly, right? So if you tell people you don't speak the truth in love, you can cause damage. You can be grievous words, even though it's the truth. Uh, Matthew 10, 16. So all this, you know, and we've talked all about soul winning today, talked about Spotio, talked about the Bibles, talked about the commandment, you know, women going as well, talking about some tips. And all this... Why? This is sort of the verse I always think of when I think about being effective in this world. It says Jesus says here, Behold, I send you forth as sheep in the midst of wolves. Be therefore wise as serpents 
and harmless as doves. So again, an exhortation to be harmless, to be gentle, right? To be soft with people, but at the same time, we've got to be wise, right? And that's why we have all these different you know, systems and whatnot. We're just trying to be more effective, be as effective as we can, um, to be as wise as we can, so we can have the most impact we can with the amount of people that we have. All right, so I hope you learned a lot today. Let's pray and then we'll sing one more song. Thank you, Lord, for your word. Um, thank you for, uh, uh, Lord, just uh, everything we have to be able to be more effective. Lord, um, what, we, what, we, what we have, Lord, is resources in our life, but we don't have time because, Lord, we fill our life with too many things. We, we don't prioritize, Lord. There's a lot of things that can distract us. So I pray, Lord, that you'd help us to not be taken away with the thorns of this world. Lord, help us to be wise as serpents and harmless as doves. Help us, Lord, to take ownership of our ministry as a soul winner and help us to be the most effective soul winner we can be. We thank you, Lord. We pray that you give us wisdom and grace. Uh, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.